Good evening, everybody. I'm Chris Allen, Engineering Director here at Mayor of Stevenage, Councillor Sandra Barr, Air Chief Marshal, Sir Mike Wigston, Chief of the Air Staff, Howard Nye, President of the Royal Aeronautical Society, Honourable Guests, Members, Ladies and Gentlemen. As a Fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society and President of the Stevenage Branch, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to MBDA for the annual Leslie Bedford Lecture 2021. As you no doubt noticed, uh, we had to cancel the 2020 event due to the COVID crisis. And this year we've switched to a virtual event in order to continue this important event with the restrictions we currently have, but hopefully for not so long. Many of you will already know the history of Leslie Bedford and the reasons why this annual lecture is held in his name. When English Electric and de Havilland moved to Stevenage, Leslie Bedford was part of that team in his role as Director of Engineering on what was then known as Site A. And there's some echoes of that history here today. So we stand here on Site A, now the home of MBDA in the UK, whose lineage goes back to de Havilland in 1954. And I have the honour of introducing this event as the current Engineering Director at MBDA. But maybe that's where the similarities end, as Liza Bedford is described of a, of a man of immense intellectual stature and a fiendish sense of humour. He was one of the most respected and innovative British pioneers in the field of radar and guided weapons technology. And as a noted fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, Leslie Bedford would no doubt appreciate this virtual gathering of like-minded engineers and the many achievements and dedication that the society members bring here this evening. But I know you're not here to listen to me, so without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston for the 2021 Sir Leslie Bedford Lecture. Sir Mike. Thank you very much, Chris, for the warm welcome to MBDA Stevenage and the opportunity at last to present the Leslie Bedford Lecture. My congratulations to Al Byford and the team for your perseverance in keeping the date alive. I'll start by paying tribute to today's namesake, Leslie Bedford, and the major role he played in the development of radar and in the defense of this country in the Second World War. He was a phenomenal engineer working at the very cutting edge of technology at that time. By 1940, the UK had fielded a truly groundbreaking new technology, the chain home radar, with receivers built by Leslie Bedford. In working out how to employ the novel capability, the UK had two options. Focus on radar's primary function to de detect enemy forces beyond visual range, or consider why radar matters and how it might dovetail into a vision of a broader, integrated detection command and control system. The decision to think through the why and not just the what was decisive. The Germans had radar too, but in contrast, the Germans' early use of their technologically high quality radars was relatively inept because the, the wider conceptual thought as to why radar was significant was missing. They opted for form before function, and the rest is history. The technology alone was not enough. It's what the culture of your enterprise allows you to do with it that really makes the difference. Collectively, we could have the greatest technological investment and innovation in the world, and the greatest partnerships. But if we don't have the right people like Leslie Bedford, and the innovative organizational mindset and culture to imagine the changes we need to make and then make them happen quickly, we will not maintain that decisive edge we know we need for the future. As my thoughts turn to implementing the integrated review, I know it is our collective innovative mindset and culture that will enable us to seize the significant opportunities we have been presented with. I'm sure most of you will have studied with interest the significant announcements made over the last six months around security and defence, Britain's place in the world, the role of the UK Armed Forces, and of course, the role of the aerospace sector in all of that. 
Those announcements started with the November spending round and the £24.1 billion uplift in defence funding over the next four years. The publication of the integrated operating concept at the end of last year and the integrated review, defence command paper and defence and security industrial strategy released in March. Across all of those announcements, I would offer three important themes. Firstly, the uncertain, complex and dynamic international context with fast evolving threats becoming ever more sophisticated and proliferating widely. Secondly, in this era of chronic instability, we have a UK that's prepared and able to act on the world stage as a problem solving, burden sharing nation amplifying our influence through deeper relationships and partnerships. And thirdly, that this government could not be clearer in its view of the integral role of the UK armed forces in UK national power. As those themes played out over the last year, the Royal Air Force proposition was very clear. I need not labour the point to this audience, but air and space power gives our government the operational choice and ability to act on a global stage at speed, at range and precisely with minimal political risk and maximum political choice. Air and space power is the decisive enabler of operations in the land and maritime environments and of course can deliver decisive effect in itself. And day after day, our people ram home that message by demonstrating the utility of air and space power from protecting our skies and patrolling our seas in the UK and Falkland Islands to bolstering our NATO allies on operations in Afghanistan or Mali or taking the fight to Daesh in their sanctuaries in Syria and Iraq where left to their own devices I'm in no doubt they would be fomenting attacks on the streets of the UK and our allies. Our exemplary operational track record of today is not enough though. We must be ready to face the threats of the future because we can no longer assume unchallenged access to air and space domains. The threats we face are increasingly sophisticated with new combat aircraft, missiles and stealth technology challenging our air superiority. Space is now a contested domain. So we have to radically overhaul how we are organised, our training, our bases and the aircraft and equipment we operate. Above all, it will be the enduring quality and talent of our people that will preserve the Royal Air Force's decisive edge into the future. So there can be no higher priority than ensuring we continue to attract, recruit, sustain and retain the people we need, regular, reserve, civil servants and contractors. We are already increasing the flexibility our people have on a daily basis through flexible employment and throughout their careers by introducing 11 professions that replace the 68 branches and trades that exist today. We're expanding our reserve and the roles they take. We have a new normal of rejoining and lateral, lateral entry even. Around 400 people rejoined us last year, all on terms and conditions of service that reflect a modern people-focused people organisations for regular and reserves. The Royal Air Force offers hugely rewarding opportunities to people from all backgrounds and we're working hard to improve our ethnic and gender diversity to benefit from the widest possible pool of talent in the UK workforce. I was really delighted to hear last week that the Royal Air Force had won the Rising Stars Company of the Year award against some really stiff competition in recognition of what we have done to actively support and develop our female talent pipeline through initiatives, training and development programmes. And last year, I'm proud to say that one in five of our recruits were women and one in 10 were from UK ethnic minorities. These are record breaking figures and it did stress the organisation, but I want us to do even better, doubling by, uh, by 2030 to 40% recruiting of women and 20% from ethnic minorities. We talk about space, Tempest, autonomous pro, uh, platforms and all of the remarkable things that the Royal Air Force has set out to do. But this change to our workforce 
is without doubt amongst the most profound. But up there, amongst the most profound issues we must also focus on, is environmental sustainability. I know you're probably thinking it's crazy to hear an air chief talking about this. However, the imperative is clear. Our politicians will increasingly demand it of us because our public demands it of us. And the young people in the Royal Air Force today demand it of me and my leadership team that we should be taking a lead in this. The current government mandated date for us to be net zero is 2050, but I've set the Royal Air Force the challenge of net zero by 2040 because everything I see and hear tells me that 2050 date will come forward. The way we power our aircraft, the way we power our bases, the way we talk to our supply chain, to our industrial suppliers about their carbon and sustainable practices are all going to be things that we're going to have to tackle. It will take decades and we need to start now. Much of this will be done on the back of what the commercial aviation sector is doing, and the UK has taken a world-leading position in that regard. I sit on the Jet Zero Council, which brings together leaders from across UK aerospace and aviation to focus our efforts. A large part of this is about commercialising synthetic aviation fuel production and making sure that it's cost-effective and available for civil aviation because our platforms are already able to operate on 50-50 blend today, and, and we would if an assured supply was there. I've also initiated activity to get our platforms to 100% synthetic aviation fuel, and I'm determined we will have our first zero emission aircraft operational by the end of this decade. It will not be easy, but I don't see it as discretionary. And it's something that I'm telling our next generation of leaders to get their heads around because it will largely fall to them to deliver. The RAF's approach to the integrated review was about the growing threat, the utility of air and space power, and about technological innovation. In, in those terms, we would all recognize the strategic significance of the two billion pound investment over the next four years in the future combat air system. We're taking a revolutionary approach, looking at a game-changing mix of swarming drones and mixed formations of uncrewed combat aircraft, as well as next-generation piloted aircraft like Tempest. Our uncrewed combat aircraft, Mosquito, is taking shape in Belfast, and our experimental swarming drone, Alvina, is fielded with 216 Squadron. This isn't the stuff of a distant sci-fi future, we're driving hard to operationalize Mosquito and Alvina alongside Typhoon and Lightning in this decade. As a brilliant engineer and technological problem solver, I would like to think that Leslie Bedford would have been fascinated and ready to get stuck into what we are doing on FCAS and Tempest. And I know that his worthy successors are already doing exactly that. Tempest and projects like it enable us to take a world-leading approach alongside the UK aerospace industry, creating highly skilled jobs across the nation and collaborating with our defence and security partners around the world. And having just toured the MBDA site here at Stevenage, I'm clear in my mind that maintaining a world-leading complex weapons capability is a fundamental element of the UK's operational independence and our operational advantage in the contested future battle space. The defence aerospace sector generates £6 billion a year and employs over 46,000 workers across the four nations of the United Kingdom. This is about sovereignty, it is about prosperity, and it is about security. You've heard me say this once or twice before, but you cannot have prosperity without security, and you cannot have security without prosperity. The Royal Air Force has a unique relationship with our world-class aerospace and tech industries, and the defence and security industrial strategy will be the basis for a new level of partnership. I've spoken about the significance of FCAS and Tempest, but I think future generations will remember the 2021 Integrated Review as, as much for what it said about our ambition in space as what it said about FCAS and Tempest. We are all dependent on space, whether that is in our personal lives or in the unique operational advantage it provides us and our closest allies. So we must ensure the safety and security of the space domain. That means understanding what malign actors are doing in space, 
That means having the means of protecting our critical interests and freedom of operation in space. And that means being prepared to fight to defend those interests if it came to it. Space matters to all of us across our day-to-day -day lives, and the space domain is changing fast. We see activity by countries like Russia and China that gives us cause for concern, from questionable, reckless activity to tests of equipment overtly designed to disrupt, deny, or destroy space platforms. So we have to be ready to protect and, if necessary, defend our critical interests in space. And just as we protect and control the skies, we must protect the security of the space domain, not only for our access to those vital space-based services, but also to protect and enable multi-domain activity by land, sea, air, and cyberspace. If we don't think and prepare today, we won't be ready when the time comes. That's why the government's decision to establish the UK Space Command is such an important step, coupled with the announcement of £1.4 billion uplift in defence space spending. That investment will enable us to enhance our space command and control and our communications with international allies, as well as our coordination with commercial partners. It will enable us to build our space domain awareness to better understand what is going on. In parallel, we will continue to develop the Sovereign Space Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Program, and we will establish a space academy to generate the skills and expertise we know we need for the future. Space and our assured access to it is fundamental to military operations, and I am very proud that the Royal Air Force has been given the responsibility to establish UK Space Command at RAF High Wycombe. And that's on behalf of the Ministry of Defence and the government. It's an exciting and significant moment for all of us. And in terms of this lecture, it's very fitting to think that Leslie Bedford was himself fascinated by the opportunities presented by space technology, including playing a significant role in the Ariel 3 project, the UK's first satellite launch. The integrated review and the command paper are our framework for building the armed forces of the future. And it is the operating, uh, integrated operating concept that sets out how we will use them in this era of persistent competition. Our adversaries exploit our seams and they exploit our legal, moral and ethical thresholds of response. That's why we talk so much in the integrated operating concept of multi-domain integration and competing below the threshold of conflict. In that regard, I can't think of a better example of multi-domain in integration than the carrier strike group that departed a week ago on a seven-month deployment. And I include cyber and space in that force mix too. We are one of the most globally interconnected countries in the world. So an open and resilient international order is the best way to ensure our prosperity and our security. The Carrier Strike Group will showcase the UK's ability to project global influence and bring to life the deeper UK focus on the Indo-Pacific, a region that the Integrated Review identified as critical to our economy, our security, and our global ambition to support that open and resilient international order. At the Strike Group's heart, of course, is our ability to operate fifth-generation combat aircraft from the sea. Lightning is a phenomenal warfighting machine from land or sea, and this year, 617 Squadron and our Lightning Force is demonstrating that enormous utility from HMS Queen Elizabeth. The UK Armed Forces of the future must be ready to understand, decide, and then act faster with even greater precision, lethality, and in more places around the world than we do today. The integrated review and the command paper have given us a significant mandate to modernize. And I'm clear to my leadership team of their role in leading the way in that. The Royal Air Force has a well-earned reputation for excellence in all that we do. Our work is often challenging and hazardous, and that requires motivated and capable people at all levels of the service. While cutting edge aircraft, platforms and systems are fundamental to that rep reputation and our success. It is the quality and talent of our people that ultimately makes the difference. And it is our leaders at every level of command and line management 
who have to work relentlessly to unleash that talent. That leadership is what today's and tomorrow's Royal Air Force is all about, inspiring people to achieve exceptional things in the service of our country, protecting the UK's sovereignty, prosperity and security into the future, and above all, ensuring the future defence of our skies and space. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Good evening. My name is Howard Nye, and I'm speaking to you today as president of the Royal Aeronautical Society. I'm honoured to have been invited by the Stevenage branch to attend this Leslie H. Bedford named lecture. To honour the contribution to aerospace, aviation or space of a certain individual, in this case Leslie H. Bedford, who was one of the most respected and innovative British pioneers in the field of radar and guided weapon technology, and who passed away in 1989. Leslie Bedford had an extraordinary career. Perhaps most interesting today was his role as Director of Engineering at British Aircraft Corporation's Weapons Group, developing the Thunderbird 1 and 2 air missile systems, then personally committing himself early in the space era to consider the possibilities of communication satellites in geostationary orbit, a concept popularised by the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke in the 40s as a way to revolutionise tele telecommunications, but not actually accepted at the time. I first of all wish to thank MBDA and their UK Managing Director Chris Allen for hosting this lecture in these unusual and difficult times. Mr Allen is both a Fellow of the Society and President of the RAS Stevenage Branch. Our thanks also go to the Stevenage Branch Chair, Mr Marcus Fenlon, and his dedicated committee of branch volunteers and not forgetting the company providing the live stream broadcast facility, Dancing Squirrel. We're very grateful to you all. But our main vote of thanks this evening goes to Sir Michael Wigston, Chief of the Air Staff. We sincerely thank you, Sir Michael, for taking the time to share your very interesting insight into the key themes currently affecting the UK as both an air and a space power. We thank you for your continuing support to the Stevenage Branch Leslie Bedford Lecture Series and look forward, look forward to inviting you once again in 2022, hopefully in front of a live audience. Thank you very much indeed, and a very good evening to you all. Good evening.